if you feel like the odds are stacked against you, always mm -hmm. do the most. Mm -hmm. Dress well. How mm -hmm. you present yourself is going to take you, it's going to be about 60% of what takes you where you're going. Mm -hmm. Speak well, be reliable, be professional, be kind, be genuine, um, and have a goal. And just think, be very laser focused on what you want to achieve. Um, at the end of the day, I think most people don't realize how insular everyone is. I think if you think that someone is going to deny you opportunities because of the color of your skin, if you really think objectively, that person has their own issues. That person is probably not thinking about you. That person doesn't go home and think, how can I pull this person down? And I think it's very easy to get kind of caught in this myopic, very negative, pessimistic view of things. Um, but if you really just give yourself the best chance and always put your best foot forward, no matter what, no matter how you're feeling, and sometimes that might be cutting negative people out of your, your life so you can be more focused and be more well-rounded and positive, you must do it. Hi everyone, um, welcome to this week's edition of the Against All Odds podcast. My name is Daniel Coker, your host, and this week we are privileged to have um, my niece, um, she's been warned not to refer to me as uncle, <laughs> um, Esther Krakul, she's a, a writer and a broadcaster of, um, of great renown, and um, I'm sure she's got a wonderful story that we can all learn from. So Esther, you've had a very interesting career. Yes, I mean, uncle. They <laughs> <laughs> won't not to call me uncle. Um, the last two or three times I met with you was when we went to Car Giant to pick yeah. up your first car. Yeah. And then um, fast forward a few months ago, I got to the office and I was scanning through the news and I, I saw someone who looked like you on on, <laughs> on a Sky News um broadcast talking about uh, Harry and Meghan you know? yeah. and um, <laughs> I said I didn't think it was you right so I, I, I looked a bit, a bit closer and it said um, interview with Esther Credico I was, I was pleasantly surprised because the last time I saw you you were, you were working somewhere in, uh, in marketing yeah. I think in sales and um, so tell us a bit about your story about how you transitioned you know, after a degree in political science and French at Bristol University, yeah. you know, and how, and how you find yourself in, in the space that you are now in, 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 in broadcasting. Well, it's quite an odd story, uh, I'll be honest. I, I didn't even expect it myself. <laughs> my, my life in the last few years has been a pleasant surprise. Um, so when I graduated from Bristol, I got a normal job. I was working in tech sales. Um, but I had a friend um, at university who was a journalist for an American newspaper. Um, I believe it was Brian Hall, anyway. Um, and we weren't particularly close, but he just, he kind of messaged me and said, hi, how are you? I haven't seen you since university. And then he mentioned that he had a friend that was starting up an organization for students, sort of a grassroots um, sort of political organization with trying to promote conservative values on student campuses. And there was basically no, no organization like this in the UK at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so he was like, he would like someone to, um, you know, do short clips and do interviews with MPs and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, that's fine. I mean, I don't mind interviewing people. And they paid me like 20 quid of an interview. So I was like, I don't. It was, it was basically no money. But I was so happy to do it. Yeah. Um, because I was always politically conscious. But I, in my mind, I just thought, I never even thought you could make a career out of it. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought I had to do the serious thing and, you know, get a job in, in some sort of mm -hmm. company and then work my way up. I, mm -hmm. I never really thought outside of that. I never even thought I could, what I'm doing now, I could actually make a living out of. Mm -hmm. Um. And so I did that, and then I eventually started uh, doing a bit more writing. Um, I got on the radar of, of certain people that I was interviewing, which was mm -hmm. very weird to me because I treated it like it was a job, but it was very much fun for me. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I was like, you know, this is just a hobby. Mm -hmm. And so all through that, I was still working in sales and marketing eventually, and mm -hmm. I was kind of still trying to steer myself towards a more corporate route. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's not really where my, my heart was. It mm -hmm. was just it was just to do the sensible thing, go to university. Um, and then with, with my work, I started um, getting contacted by producers to see if I wanted to cover certain segments and if I wanted to, you know, do a few kind of short um, interviews here and there. Mm -hmm. And that kind of snowballed. And I didn't understand why, because because it was a hobby for me. I didn't really I wasn't even thinking about being good at it. I just mm -hmm. thought I'm around these people. I'm having intellectually stimulating conversations outside mm -hmm. of a job that I'm not particularly interested in mm -hmm. doing. I'm not passionate about. But I just I like the fact that I had that relief of doing something that I enjoyed. Mm -hmm. And because I treated it like a job, because I treated it seriously, because I was so grateful for even the opportunity to be in a room with people that I admired, um, it, it, it 
people noticed me. So mm-hmm. I didn't I didn't actually put myself out there in, in the sense that I was actually looking to do this full time. I just got noticed. Um, and I that's basically how it started. And I started getting offers to do some Sky Breakfast briefings and then some stuff on LBC and, um, oh gosh, well, ITV. Mm-hmm. And that snowballed, basically. Um, okay. So... I mean, it was never, there's, there is a, a tendency in this industry because media kind of draws big personalities and people that are a bit more self-centered, I would say. Mm-hmm. And there's a tendency to think that, oh, anyone who wants to do that kind of camera facing or public facing role is, mm-hmm. a, is a raging narcissist and they just want to be a shock jock and say things to kind <laughs> of, you know, get attention. Because traditionally, that's how people got on, mm-hmm. on the radar of, mm-hmm. of, 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 uh, of producers and news stations. They said something in Sindri. They, they created a, they got a reaction out of people and that's okay. basically how it snowballed. And I, mm-hmm. and I was really against that because for me it was completely genuine. Mm-hmm. I would still be doing what I was doing now even if I wasn't paid a penny for it. And I had no interest in kind of saying things that were in Sindri or, mm-hmm. you know, just to get a reaction out of someone. I gen- genuinely just said what I thought. Mm-hmm. And I think that's probably what made the difference for me and where I am in my career because everyone knows that if I don't believe in it, I'm not going to say it. Mm-hmm. And I was never willing to compromise on my values or my integrity. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's how it happened. Fantastic. Um, I must say, I've seen you <clears throat> speak on, a, on certain podiums and, you know, you sort of make it sound like it's all kind of come to you and it's, you know, you, you were not really expecting it and all that. But having listened to you speak, I, I've, one thing that I, I noticed was that you know your stuff. You know, because um, you can't put yourself out in the public, in, in media, in broadcasting, you know, and be flaky, yeah. you know, because I, I heard you give a speech, I can't remember the exact topic, but it was very intellectual, you know. I mean, how, how do you manage to grasp this sort of um, level of knowledge? Um, like I said, I guess it was, it was generally something I was passionate about. I mean, I studied politics in French at university, so that okay. kind of helped me as well. I think I often tell people, I mean, I have many thoughts on arts degrees in general, but mm-hmm. I, I often say that if you can read, write, speak, and think critically, you're a more powerful weapon than sort of the best engineer or software engineer out there. Okay. Because I think they're a very small subsect of society, but they're the thinker class. Mm-hmm. They're the people that can generate ideas and communicate them in an articulate way and engage critically with people and refine those ideas. And those are the ideas that push society forward. Um, and you know you find them in all fields but I feel like that class that thinker class in any industry is key mm-hmm. the thinker class that can you know take ideas from that particular subset of, 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 of you know I suppose ideas or what a subject and refine it and or analyze it refine it communicate it tweak it improve it communi- um, convince people all of that I think that is a very key stratosphere in any industry whether it's medicine or philosophy or politics or whatever mm-hmm. Um, I, I took an interest because it was just, I like people and I like to analyze people and I like to analyze society as a whole. And so when I wasn't sort of study, um, working or at university studying, I was always reading, I was always trying to find out new things. Um, and I, I guess that's just, my background has helped me a lot in what I do. Again, I wasn't expecting to do any of this. It just, it literally just happened. Um, but I, I didn't even realize that was something that made me better at my job. Um, but having do, done what I've, I've been doing now for the last few years, I can I see that it makes a difference. Fantastic. So having transitioned into a new space as, as aware, I mean, even though you've said at university you're doing interviews and all that, and sort of you, you naturally grew into it, have you ever had to deal with imposter syndrome? You know, sort of finding yourself thinking... You know, am I really qualified to do this? Do I deserve to be here? You know, because outwardly looking at you, and I've, I've watched many videos of you and all, you, you're very confident, you're very much in your element, in your space. True, you said you're passionate about what you're doing and you, you do it even if it was for free. You know, but how have you dealt with imposter syndrome? Because sometimes when you make the transition, you know, there's feelings of doubt and, mm-hmm. and, and feel like you don't really belong here. Yeah. All the time. Oh my gosh, I, st- I still feel it now. There's still there's still some weeks mm-hmm. where I get so obsessed with with kind of reading up and just knowing as much as I can on a certain topic. But mm-hmm. everyone knows that if you work in sort of the political broadcasting industry mm-hmm. and journalism, you need 
to take breaks because that it can really affect you. I mean, some people get upset just watching the news because they think the world yeah. is falling apart. So imagine being <laughs> in the thick of it. Yeah. Uh, you really have to kind of um, be able to uh, separate those parts of your lives. I get it all the time. I just find mm-hmm. it so bizarre. I just, mm-hmm. you know, I, I moved here in 2010 from Ghana. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just in school. I got a normal job like everyone else. I went to university like anyone else. Why me? Why am I in this mm-hmm. situation? I never mm-hmm. I put myself forward. Mm-hmm. You know, there are people that have worked in my industry as uh, journalists and academics and civil servants for well mm-hmm. over a decade before mm-hmm. they even get invited onto any sort of program. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've done the most significant things that I would like to do in my career, sort of mm-hmm. the, the big part of it, in such a short space of time. Mm-hmm. So the imposter syndrome is always there. And I think people get a sort of more grandiose view of myself when mm-hmm. they watch me than what I actually think of myself, mm-hmm. which is it's, it's human psychology. When you see mm-hmm. someone on a TV, you mm-hmm. kind of, you, you get a much um, more, uh, I don't know, extravagant view of themselves, mm-hmm. of the, pe- the person in front of you. How do I deal with it? I think it's just trying to make sure that I'm always prepared. Okay. I think I feel less like an imposter if I know that I've at least done the work. <laughs> That's um, true. And sometimes it takes, you know, it takes comparing mm-hmm. yourself to other people mm-hmm. um, because they're people that are in the same situation as you. How are they dealing with it? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, asking yourself, do you feel like you, you take what you do seriously enough to feel a real sense of responsibility while you're doing it? Um, and that's that's difficult, um, obviously, especially given my age and not even mm-hmm. kind of even planning to do this. I take mm-hmm. advice from a lot of people in my industry that do what I do, mm-hmm. but are kind of more open to to helping me on my journey. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's, it's I always feel it. I always feel imposter syndrome. It's it's very weird not to. Yeah, that's good. Right, I'm gonna. You're doing well. You're not calling me uncle. <laughs> that's, that's, that's that's fantastic. Um, I'm gonna move on to a bit of a touchy subject um so you've got to get ready for this uncle should i be worried (laughs) (laughs) okay so you happen to have been born into a very prominent um ghanaian family you know very very prominent and um you you could basically i mean you had the best of education you know right from you know from your primary school secondary school um you're able to move over here to finish your um, well, you, you finished your secondary school here. Yeah. You know, you were in boarding school. Mm-hmm. You know, and then you went into Bristol University. Um, and I'm just kind of wondering, you know, if that kind of upbringing, you know, helped you to build up your confidence because you you come across very confident. Yeah. You know, and you're you're in a space that is not dominated by people of our type of colour, you know, yeah. black, Asian or minority ethnic. Yeah. You know, but you you seem to be very confident, you know, and I'm just kind of wondering if your upbringing and your, you know, your educational path, you know, probably contributed in some way, you know, into moulding you into the person that you are. You know, I don't think so because I've seen there are loads of girls that I went to school with and I've I've seen how they've turned out and they just they seem very I feel like they haven't achieved their potential. I would say mm-hmm. that what makes the big difference for me is gratitude. Mm-hmm. Um, I was always aware that even when I was in Ghana and I was in sort of the school that I was there, I was more fortunate than other people. Mm-hmm. And I never even dared compare myself to people abroad because it was just kind of outside the realm of possibility mm-hmm. for me. I think what made the difference was I was always so grateful. Mm-hmm. Even when I was doing things that I didn't think, I, I, I was like, what am I doing here? It mm-hmm. was just there are people that don't have these opportunities, so I need to make the best of them. I've, I work with people from all sorts of backgrounds and I, I actually find that people that are privately educated that have the most privilege actually don't tend to do very well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that doesn't seem that way because if you look at a lot of public facing roles, you have these public school boys mm-hmm. that went to these fantastic universities and mm-hmm. you know may have gotten to where they are because of nepotism. But actually, mm-hmm. when you zoom mm-hmm. out, it's really the most driven people that are goal oriented that make it. Uh, I remember uh, Uncle Chief and Auntie Stella, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they were telling me, I remember mm-hmm. Auntie Stella was telling me, she was like, when she when she started out working, uh, especially when she moved to the US, she was like, she didn't see racism, not because it wasn't there, but because, well, in her words, you had to use a brick, hit her head with a brick for her to notice because she mm-hmm. was so focused. Mm-hmm. She had a goal and that's what she was, she was orienting herself to achieving that goal. And she was very mm-hmm. grateful because she always looked back and just saw the progression of her life and was just like, you know, I'm so grateful I, I got from point A to point B. Let me just keep going. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's what made the difference. I, I, I always felt this deep sense of responsibility and almost guilt if I ever felt like I was complaining. Because mm-hmm. I'm like, wow, there are people that don't even have these opportunities. What are you complaining about? Mm-hmm. I think that's what made the difference. And 
you know, seeing seeing my peers and people that I was in school with mm-hmm. and, you know, I was around growing up, I used to think that that would give them a leg up. I mm-hmm. genuinely used to think that those were the only kind of people that I would see in positions mm-hmm. of prominence and doing the most amazing things. But mm-hmm. that was never the case, actually. It was mm-hmm. very rarely the case. It was genuinely just people that had this grit about them that mm-hmm. were so focused and refused to stop at anything. Mm-hmm. But you see, you look at a person like, I mean, in the UK now, we've got our first... Um, British Asian uh, Prime Minister, mm. and if you look at Rishi Sunak's career path, you know he went to Winchester College. You know his parents, obviously immigrants from East Africa, put him through uh, the best of education. He went out, mm. got a degree, you know, got a job, moved to New York or moved to California and all that. And I'm just kind of thinking that what are the chances if he didn't have that um, sort of a um, head start, mm. you know, in terms of the quality of, the quality of education, you know, and this was just a, some, a normal person somewhere in East London or South yeah. London living in a council flat, you know, would they ever have a chance, you know, to, 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 to rise up against the odds? I mean, I have a lot of um, friends that are academics, actually, and they, they study stuff like social integration, social cohesion and all of mm-hmm. that, because I've been very fascinated about this as well. Mm-hmm. And the best head start you can have in life is growing up in a stable two-parent home. Yeah. And I know mm-hmm. that, and th- there are loads of statistics to back this up. So mm-hmm. if you look at, you know, the, the ethnic minorities in this country that mm-hmm. tend to um, be the most successful, they tend to be Indian and, and Chinese, British. Mm-hmm. The single motherhood rate in India, in Indian fa- um, families in this country is 6%. Okay. In white British families, they're around 20, 22%. Mm-hmm. In black African families, they're about 40, 42%. And in okay. uh, black Caribbean families, they're 62%. Wow. But what makes the difference is if you grow up in a single parent household or a single mother household, mm-hmm. because they're usually single mother led, mm-hmm. your chance of growing up in childhood poverty raises from three in ten mm-hmm. to one in two, which is a coin toss. Wow. And there's so many sort of socioeconomic factors that go along with that. Because mm-hmm. if you grow up in, in a sort of with a lack of um, stable social structure in the form of a two parent home mm-hmm. and your, your chance of growing up in relative childhood poverty are significantly higher. Mm-hmm. That does affect your chances. Now, that's not everyone, mm-hmm. um, but it you know it depends. It really does impact the kind of values that you're raised with as well. Because if you grow up in a, a, a single parent household, your mother is likely very busy working all the time, mm-hmm. and she may not have the time to dedicate towards in, in, instilling certain values in you. Mm-hmm. Uh, someone I really admire, Tim Campbell, um, mm-hmm. who was on The Apprentice. I, I filmed a few shows with him. Mm-hmm. You know, he 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 makes the point that yes, he did grow up in a, a single parent household, and his mom was, uh, I believe, Jamaican. Mm-hmm. But she was also Catholic. She was deeply religious, and she mm-hmm. always stressed the importance of their education and them growing up with certain values. So, mm-hmm. you know, there was no mucking about in the house. The discipline was very strong. She was always telling them, you know, mm-hmm. you can achieve what mm-hmm. you want if you put the hard work in. Mm-hmm. And I, I genuinely believe that's what makes the difference. And a lot of data um, is a, it's a testament, um, testifies to this. Mm-hmm. I think there is actually something quite nefarious about um, people believing that because they didn't go to the private school mm-hmm. and, you know, have all this surrounded by people with certain wealth and privilege that they don't have the chance. Because I say this, often it's those people that are more laissez-faire and more blasé about their future Mm -hmm. but also having grit puts you at you know a much bigger advantage than the people that you think you Mm -hmm. you can't come into contact with Mm -hmm. and i i genuinely believe that's what makes the difference i think it's that there's so many social factors that influence people's ability to achieve so if you look at sort of white working class boys Mm -hmm. you would expect them to kind of be ahead of the totem pole they're the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to um, scholastic attainment Mm -hmm. right so we have this image of really what kind of people will see at the top mm-hmm. but if you if you look at the biggest factors that contribute to it it's family setup and its values mm-hmm. and it's often the people from two parent homes that tend to be more religious mm-hmm. that have the best head start oh that's interesting that's interesting to know yeah harry and megan <laughs> no please <laughs> please don't like, oh. <laughs> i couldn't miss this opportunity <laughs> You're a bit of a Harry and Meghan specialist. Oh my gosh. So do you think the monarchy is is racist or did Meghan just conform to the angry black woman stereotype? I don't even think she knew she was a black woman until she came to the UK. I actually thought she was Puerto Rican because I used to watch her show. I was like, oh, who is this beautiful Puerto Rican girl? Uh, So it was kind of a shock to me. She was like, I'm 60% Nigerian. I was like, wait, what? (laughs) I'm sorry. Um, Look, I, the thing is that the three sides to every story, their side, the royal family side and the truth. I always, my caveat to every time I talk about them is we'll never know the actual truth. Okay. But the thing is, because they are the ones that are camera facing and they're the ones mm-hmm. that have the Netflix specials and the Oprah interviews mm-hmm. and they put out their side of the story so mm-hmm. much, 
We can only go by what they say. Mm-hmm. Um, I I don't know if the royal family is racist. I would suspect it's not because if I had a child with someone who wasn't of my race, mm-hmm. my family would be like, they wonder what color the kid would be. Mm-hmm. I think when they said, and this what they said specifically was the concern about the darkness of their child. Mm-hmm. I was like, well, that's clearly racist, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And then when they backpedaled and said, no, it's not racist, it's unconscious bias. I was like, you don't know what you're talking about. Because, <laughs> you know, you can't, mm-hmm. I take offense mm-hmm. when you try and, belittle the public we all mm-hmm. have our own minds and we can all see that mm-hmm. um i think there, there are a couple that uh, uh invite a lot of uh discussion because i think mm-hmm. they reflect many aspects of society mm-hmm. i don't think most people who even followed this harry and Meghan saga were particularly fond of the royal family they were mm-hmm. just kind of a thing in the background mm-hmm. but because they reflected a lot of their, their views or their notions of the institution of the uk at large mm-hmm. they kind of took it up as a sort of core celeb Mm-hmm. Um, until they backpedaled on actually it's not racism and then they mm-hmm. were just like, people lost interest and mm-hmm. um, that's why we're now at the point of just you know kind of enough with the oversharing mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. they stopped being poster children for what people thought they were fighting against mm-hmm. um, and also kind of gets hard to feel sorry for a prince and princess during a cost of living crisis but that's just you know on, on the fringe um, mm-hmm. I don't. I really. I don't know the nature of that interaction. Um, I. I. I said from the beginning. I don't think she was the best suited to being in the royal family in the way that she was because, I think she didn't have enough time to understand the institution to get mm-hmm. into it. I often lay a lot of blame at Harry's feet because I was like, you were. You were the person that brought her into this. You should have prepared yeah. her a lot more. Mm-hmm. You know. You knew she was what thirty five plus when you married her and you mm-hmm. wanted a family. Mm-hmm. There was nothing stopping you from saying we're going to get married and not take on royal duties and just focus on our family and ourselves mm-hmm. and ingratiate ourselves into our own lives and then maybe ease our way into the institution. I think that would have saved a lot of this mm-hmm. headache. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Kate Middleton was this twenty year old uni student that was being harassed by the paparazzi just mm-hmm. for having the audacity to dip. You know, mm-hmm. William, mm-hmm. and they dated for ten years because mm-hmm. he really wanted to make sure that she knew exactly what she was getting into. Yeah. Um, so I think that's probably what people should focus more on than rather trying to nitpick of whether it was racist, whether it was not. Mm-hmm. I mean, from now, what we're seeing now and the kind of the inconsistencies and what they've been saying, we can safely say that it probably wasn't that. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, um, we never know. Good. In Gozi Fulani. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting one because. Yeah. Um, Something I, I occasionally do when I meet people from different backgrounds, I just ask, you know, where are you from? Yeah. You know, and this lady, the senior member of the royal family, um, Lady Hassi, I think she's yeah, called. Yeah, Susan Hassi. You know, she got into a lot of trouble, you know, asking Ngozi Fulani, you know, where she was from. But if you look at Ngozi, her, you know, her, the way she looks, her hair, yeah. the name, you know, she's gone to great uh, lengths, you know, to adopt this, um, persona, yeah. you know, which kind of fits what she's doing, you know, running the sister space charity and all yeah. that, you know. And I mean, I was pleasantly surprised when I found that she was actually born in the, in the United Kingdom and because she's, and she's Bajan. Oh, is she? Yeah, oh, okay. she's, she's she's from her parents are Barbadian. And, right. You know what's really funny? When I saw the name Gozi Fulani, I was like, ah. But Fulani is a tribe. Yeah. And you know, we we know the Fulani's yeah. growing up. They're yeah. a nomadic tribe. They're yeah. all over West Africa. Yeah. And Ngozi is a very Nigerian name. Very Nigerian name, yeah. Um, so I was curious. And I remember when I saw a picture of her mm-hmm. and I showed it to my mom and she was like, why is she dressed like a fetish priest? Yeah. And people don't know what a fetish priest is. Yeah. But, you know, that's, those are the kind of cultural references we made. Yeah. And then I had it explained to me by someone from the Caribbean saying, you know, a lot of people from the Caribbean like to... Um, feel a connection with their ancestral past Mm -hmm. um, based in Africa. And I was like, you know, that's fine. That's an argument Mm -hmm. I can take. Mm -hmm. However, there are a few problems here. Mm -hmm. She wasn't wearing any sort of... If you analyse what she was wearing to the the Buckingham Palace, she was wearing some sort of leopard print dress with Mm -hmm. these massive Africa-shaped earrings and then this... The hair. And the hair and all of that. And I was like, okay, you look like you're cosplaying at some Mm -hmm. sort of miscellaneous, Mm -hmm. maybe kind of African thing. You know, Mm -hmm. we don't wear African... Like, animal print in terms of like leopard print. We wear like yeah. kente. We have our traditional, yeah. you know, cloths, ashwabi mm-hmm. and all of that in Nigeria yeah. and all of that. So mm-hmm. that's what I was like, if you're going to do it, do it properly. Don't mm-hmm. do this kind of caricature of whatever kind of uh, ancestral mm-hmm. link you're trying to make and then mm-hmm. get offended if a woman who actually, who, who's church in Kennington actually, mm-hmm. has a majority Ghanaian and Nigerian congregation. That's interesting. So yeah. she's familiar with the name Ngozi okay. and Amaka and all of these names. So right, that's okay. why she was so curious and right. she'd never seen them dressed like that. And with all due respect, we don't even see, like, how often do black people work into yeah, walking the yeah, street? We're yeah. usually dressed in top and jeans or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I found that situation. I think what, me, what, made, what made me saddest about it, and maybe this is the Ghanaian in me, was mm. the kind of callous disrespect we have for Lady Hussey. She's 83. Yeah. 
And you know, in our culture, we're always about respect your elders, value mm-hmm. the wisdom of the past, Sankofa mm-hmm. and all of that. And mm-hmm. I just thought to treat someone of her age mm-hmm. with such callous disregard, that's what made me sad. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. I've often had, you know, old people come and ask me questions. And I had this lady from Edinburgh mm-hmm. ask me, like, you know, where, where am I from? But she was half Chinese. Mm-hmm. And she was just curious about where I was from and mm-hmm. where I went to school. She mm-hmm. was like, oh, I love your accents. I went to school in Watford. And she went to school in Glasgow. Okay. So we had those conversations. And she was almost 90. Wow. So I, 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 I was under the impression that, you know, we would, society at large would at least take that into account before mm-hmm. blowing this whole thing up and then giving her a platform. And then mm-hmm. now it turns out their investigations to how to, her charity is being run and the allocations of mm-hmm. fun and the, mm-hmm. how 200,000 pounds has suddenly gone missing. So oh, by drawing okay. the spotlight herself, I don't think she's done herself any favors. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the whole situation was mishandled and it's just mm-hmm. kind of shown how ridiculously irrational and sensitive society has become to certain mm-hmm. common sense things mm-hmm. and you know the difference is when i talk to like us like people of mm-hmm. our cultural background it mm-hmm. makes sense right mm-hmm. we understand it we don't mm-hmm. get offended but then you talk about people who have this preconceived notion mm-hmm. that they're living in a racist hellscape anyway mm-hmm. or have certain views of the royal family or britain mm-hmm. at large mm-hmm. that they're more easily they more easily adopt these sorts of negative views and i, mm-hmm. I said I, I don't live in that kind of world that's not where my mm-hmm. headspace i'm a very positive mm-hmm. person i'm very mm-hmm. open-minded mm-hmm. Um, i'm not naive in the sense that i can't understand when someone mm-hmm. is slighting me but in the last census i believe the the number of people that were not actually born in the uk and are, are of foreign origins is almost almost a quarter of the population mm-hmm. so one in four so mm-hmm. you know meeting in such a multicultural society mm-hmm how is it weird to ask someone where they're from right mm-hmm. we live we I, i've been to school with greek people turkish people lebanese mm-hmm. people you know americans uh, Congolese, all sorts mm-hmm. people from hong kong you know who looks at me and thinks oh this girl is definitely ethnically welsh mm-hmm. I mean, it's patently absurd mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so I, I just think the way society has moved is is not in the right direction and i think we should really um change course because if that's how we treat our elders then mm-hmm. the society is doomed oh that's very powerful have you encountered racism um, during your time in the UK and, and, and how have you dealt with this? And the reason I asked this question is I was reading an article written by AJ Odudu mm. and um, she wrote in the British Vogue, I think in 2020, and she was recounting her, her experiences um, growing up in, you know, in, I think it's somewhere in Lancashire or something like that, mm. and the experiences she had with parents of her friends um, when they come and visit or come and pick them up from uh, play dates and stuff like that saying they had to drive through a pack of darkies she was dating somebody and uh, she had this boyfriend and he made a comment about about uh, her makeup you know looked like poo on on, wow. on his pillow i you knew know. i knew a journalist uh, well not a journalist but she works in broadcasting with me mm-hmm. had her her boyfriend's dad said she was exotic and i was like are you a mango what do you mean, <laughs> what do you mean exotic <laughs> um, so how, how have you dealt with that um, so I've had, obviously, I've had instances of, of racism, actually more so in the US than here, um, oh. more, more blatantly in the US than here. Uh, but obviously I've had, you know, uh, classmates pass really rude comments and, you know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a very witty person, so I dish it as much as I can take it. <laughs> um, and I'll, you know, they'll pass a rude comment about uh, so where I'm from and I was like, Does your, did your mother season your chicken or something like that? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm very blunt like that. Um, but I, again, I think it's about mindset because mm-hmm. I, I'm, I, I generally believe this and this can upset or depress whoever and I, this doesn't take away from the work that people do in this regard mm-hmm. but I don't think racism is ever going to vanish just like I don't mm-hmm. think sexism will ever completely vanish or mm-hmm. homophobia or whatever, right? Whatever mm-hmm. social ill. I think people's um, views and prejudices will always stay with them in one form or another mm-hmm. and this is why I say we talk about racism in the West which is actually a very progressive discussion. If we talk about racism in China mm-hmm. for instance where there are hotels that say do not allow black residents or in places like russia i mean it's a completely different ball game they're not even hiding it they're not even mm-hmm. afraid of it you know we talk about if you look at the racist abuse that footballers of black footballers get it's usually mm-hmm. in places like russia and china mm-hmm. they mm-hmm. sometimes you have football players where they throw mm-hmm. little banana peels on the pitch mm-hmm. it's just awful um but i and i believe everyone should have this mindset regardless of the color of their skin mm-hmm. they don't have to like me they just have to get out of my way mm-hmm. And I think we're at the point in society where we're not back in the 60s where if you don't have a job or someone wouldn't hire you because of the color of your skin, there's basically mm-hmm. no other opportunities. Mm-hmm. Right? That's not the case. I mean, the, the way that I became prominent and, and noticed was through social media alongside my work mm-hmm. as a sort of political activist. Mm-hmm. And if you want to create a way, you will. Mm-hmm. I think if you have this mindset that, oh, this person doesn't like me, sometimes it might not even be racism. Sometimes mm-hmm. the person doesn't like you because they don't like your cologne. Because mm-hmm. you don't have straight teeth, mm-hmm. because they saw you dating someone they liked. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there's a whole plethora. <laughs> seriously, there's a whole plethora of reasons why someone yeah. might not like you mm-hmm. specifically. And to mm-hmm. to boil it down to racism, I mean, I think it makes sense if you're talking about you know a 
seventh seventh century barbarian that's never seen mm -hmm. someone that looks like you before mm -hmm. but i think if you turn on the tv look at the kind of how diverse casts and adverts and everything are i think to automatically assume that someone doesn't like you for racism is quite and the, the hierarchy of probability fairly low mm -hmm. so um you know that's what i would say for that especially if you live in, in the west mm -hmm. uh, but my, my advice comes down to they just don't they don't have to like you they just have to get out of your way mm -hmm. and that's about orienting yourself around have a bigger purpose and something more substantial than yourself so that mm -hmm. you can look past the petty i don't like you because of the color of your skin or because mm -hmm. you're a woman or because you, you're not tall enough or whatever mm -hmm. great moving on to another touchy subject mm. social acceptance Ooh. now if you look at people of um of color who have made it in broadcasting and, mm. and some even in sports, football and whatever. If you just observe, you know, I could give you a number of names, mm. you know, they they tend to hook up with partners who are non um, ethnic or yeah. not, not black. If you look at Trevor McDonald, Oswald Boating, yeah. even um, Edward and mm. you know, British Vogue, you know, they all have, you know, Caucasian partners. Yeah. You know. And I'm just wondering whether this is a coincidence mm -hmm. or is it a deliberate strategy, you know, to get up the social, social structure? I think it depends on where you're talking about um, this. And I, 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 um, a guy that I follow, he's an excellent writer, um, Tomiwa Wolade, um, name drop. Um, he's an excellent writer and he's, he's coming out of a book called This Is Not America. Okay. So it's kind of comparing um, these uh, racial dynamics in the US, the UK, and how the conversation has to be different. So mm -hmm. for instance, in the US, it's not uncommon, or it's, high, it's far, far, far more likely, and I mean significantly more likely, for mm -hmm. people to only have friends and acquaintances within a certain racial group. So if you look at Friends, for instance, the cast of Friends and where we're set, mm -hmm. set up, it's actually part of the norm. So mm -hmm. you can be in Atlanta, Georgia, for instance, and meet a black person. And all that person, all the people that person knows and frequently deals with are black, mm -hmm. right? And that does um, play a role in these sorts of uh, discussions. Mm -hmm. um, in the UK, for instance, that's, it's significantly less likely. Mm -hmm. So most people are more likely to have friends from different racial and ethnic minority groups. Mm -hmm. um, so... You know, it's not uncommon for someone to have an Indian friend and a Chinese friend and a British friend and all mm -hmm. of that. And that does play a role in social dynamics. I think it depends on the industry that you're talking about. So, for instance, you ask footballers, why are all black footballers have white girlfriends or mm -hmm. white wives? And it's the norm. I, I can only think of one Premier League player that has a black yeah. girlfriend, and that's um, Sterling. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And so, in the past, the explanation used to be the only women that they have access to at that sort of socioeconomic hierarchy, which mm -hmm. is fabulously wealthy, are white models, which makes sense. Right? Mm -hmm. Because when you get to that level of prominence and of notoriety and of wealth, so, you know, this, that, that makeup looks, looks a certain way. Mm -hmm. Even in football, that technically doesn't discriminate because mm -hmm. it's just based on your talent. Mm -hmm. um, I, do, I do accept that there's an element of social acceptance, but I think it was more significant in the past where it was seen as a legitimizing factor than now in the present. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it depends on, again, because when you're talking about the le that level of prominence, your branding is important. Mm -hmm. So there might be a fear that if you are with someone that looks like you, there is a, a, a tendency to just make yourself the black power couple. It's about mm -hmm. black love, like Will mm -hmm. and Jada or Gabrielle mm -hmm. Union and, mm -hmm. and her partner, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I do think there's an element there. I think it's more significant probably in my industry and what I do. Yeah. Um, so there is a, a political uh, commentator that uh, is quite well known in the US, Candace Owens, and her husband is white. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it kind of validates a lot of people that don't like her because they think, you know, you've espoused very right wing, almost what some people would say white supremacy views. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. natural that your husband is white because you have a certain element of self loathing. This is mm -hmm. what her critics would say. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that. I don't know the nature of their relationship. I haven't met them. Mm -hmm. um, but I think. Um, there is, I feel particularly less pressure on that because mm -hmm. I'm not part of that demographic. So if you ask me about whether I feel, I'll tell you, I feel Ghanaian first. Mm -hmm. I feel Ghanaian first before I feel maybe British then black, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. My Ghanaian identity as a cultural like, identity is much stronger for me mm -hmm. than any other thing, any other thing out there about me. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and, and it's, uh, informs my values and the way that I live my life. So the whole respecting your adults, calling you uncle, because I don't know your English name, uh, and all of these things. Um, so I think you have to, it, you really have to be careful in how you look at that. I can understand the argument for like the Oswald Bartings yeah. and the Enfors because of mm -hmm. the time that they grew up in. Mm -hmm. But I generally believe for my generation, it's, it's different just because it's far rarer for you to just have 
acquaintances of the same racial category just because of how society has progressed in the last uh, two to three decades. Okay. Um, but I also think um, it's far less important because society in general as a whole has become less traditional. Mm-hmm. People don't really care whether you've lived with someone for 10 years and you're not married. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine doing that in Ghana? You've lived with someone for 10 years and you're not married. No way. What? I mean, that is... Have you lost what? your mind? Are you mad? Even if you date someone for six months, they'll be like, excuse you, what are you doing with your daughter? You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think that's one of the reasons why it's also less gen- relevant in mm-hmm. my generation because mm-hmm. society as a whole has become less traditional. I mean, I can't even imagine a, a time period 30 years ago where we could disrespect Susan Hussey in the way that we did in mm-hmm. our media. Just mm-hmm. We didn't even give her the courtesy of a proper investigation. Someone mm-hmm. just put something on Twitter about their interaction mm-hmm. and now she's a racist because the whole mm-hmm. royal family is racist and blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. And then it's, mm-hmm. it's proven that actually mm-hmm. people she meets up with every Sunday mm-hmm. in her congregation are Ghanaian and Nigerian. So she mm-hmm. actually has more knowledge than the average working person about those cultures mm-hmm. and naming mm-hmm. traditions and all of that. Mm-hmm. So that's what I would say. Great. Jamal Edwards, mm. um, who passed away um, recently, yeah. You know, he, he rose to prominence and he's doing so so well. Yeah. And um it looks like he, he you know, he, he died as a result of um taking drugs. Yeah. You know. What are your thoughts on the effects of drug use among black and the black the black and ethnic minority communities? Mm. You know, and, and the impact that has on their progress. Because even if you know, I mean, look at the, where he had gotten to. I mean, the world was his oyster. You know, he had everything going for him. And all it took was just one bad decision. Yeah. You know, and that brought everything to, everything, you know, to an end. Yeah, I often say that a lot of vices in society obviously naturally affect more working class people. And because of the way social dynamics overlap, Unfortunately, a big part of that are people of ethnic minorities. That's mm-hmm. not to say that you don't have white working class people that are, uh, you know, disproportionately plagued by these sorts of things. But mm-hmm. if you have a group of, of people in a society that overwhelmingly make up a certain socioeconomic strata, that's, that impacts them more significantly. Um, but again, I think it's almost like a perfect storm because there's so many other issues overlapping there. Mm-hmm. So you have people that are working class mm-hmm. that... More, more, more likely than not, don't come from a solid two-parent home structure mm-hmm. with certain values, mm-hmm. right? And so it's a lot easier to kind of, you know, slip through the cracks, mm-hmm. right? Because you don't have that that sort of structural, uh, almost safety net to mm-hmm. keep you, uh, mm-hmm. you know, grounded. Grounded. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, I can draw to our families as an example. Right? It would be very unlikely for my cousins to 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 get into the kind of sort of drug spiral mm-hmm. just because they know Uncle Nana mm-hmm. will really ask questions. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you'll, but you'll notice, yeah. you'll pick up on trends, you'll notice their eyes are dilated, you'll mm-hmm. notice that they're not focusing. And mm-hmm. I, I, I don't think people understand how important that is. Now, obviously, I don't know the particular instance of Jamal Edwards, because mm-hmm. I do believe a lot of that was rooted in mental health issues. Mm-hmm. Just like I would say the similar thing for Amy Winehouse, who passed mm-hmm. in a similarly tragic way. Mm-hmm. But I think the issue of drug use and drugs in ethnic minority communities is more acute because mm-hmm. it's, there's so many other um, complementary factors. Mm-hmm. I, I made the point that, um, you know, investing in solid family structures and encouraging mm-hmm. you know marriage and, and conservative traditional values is more more valuable frankly mm-hmm. than investing in the police mm-hmm. because there will never be enough police force to keep society in check and the mm-hmm. saying police your children before the police does is very mm-hmm. very accurate mm-hmm. um, i've often made the point that in ghana i can i can you know i i feel very safe because i know that if someone does something to me steals mm-hmm. from me or whatever Mm-hmm. And I say, oh, um, this person did this to me, and mm-hmm. their father finds out. Well, Bruna, the, <laughs> you know, the, yeah. the, 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 the kind of the, the social um, mm-hmm. fabric is in place that mm-hmm. you, you can keep society in check without having to rely on the metropolitan police mm-hmm. to, to mm-hmm. caution your child or to mm-hmm. pick them up when they're drunk or to stop them from selling weed and all of that. Mm-hmm. You need a societal and community structure that keeps people in check. That mm-hmm. cannot be done by the government. And so mm-hmm. when we have these conversations, I often say that black people in particular we have to be in the business of solutions mm-hmm. and i have a really good friend um iman who she was actually the organizer of the blm riots and i, okay. I, I work with her a, a fair bit on sort of broadcasting i see her on her she's a lovely person mm-hmm. uh, but she was saying she was echoing my same concerns mm-hmm. we like to just talk about these things we like to say that we have an issue with drugs in our community or we have an issue with um, delinquency or truancy and all of that mm-hmm. but we have to be in the business of solutions and sometimes that's really difficult because mm-hmm. it takes a lot of introspective work mm-hmm. you're talking about oh the white man is keeping me down but why are you idolizing degenerates like mm-hmm. Nick Cannon and Future mm-hmm. who have 20 different baby mothers mm-hmm. uh, who believe that their money is going to raise their children who don't imbue any sort of family values who just mm-hmm. uh, you know act crazy all these rappers that speak in a very derogatory fashion about women and the family mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and you know traditional lifestyles mm-hmm. 
we idolize that in these communities mm -hmm. and, and various horrible grime lyrics and all of that. We mm -hmm. talk about, oh, you can't use the N word, but Jay-Z throws it in every other song, mm -hmm. right? All of these issues within our own communities that can be addressed by us, but mm -hmm. we don't want to talk about it. And anytime mm -hmm. someone else talks about it, they're either a sellout and all of that. And like I said, I, I don't really care. You know, it doesn't really bother me because it's not me that's being affected. It's mm -hmm. not something that's acute in, in my culture. Mm -hmm. If you look at scholastic attainment, for instance, the, mm -hmm. this group of students that do the absolute best mm -hmm. in terms of scholastic attainment are black West African girls in the UK. Wow. And nobody knows that. Mm -hmm. And you have to ask yourself, why do black West African girls mm -hmm. top uh, um, scholastic attainment charts in this country alongside Chinese students and Indian students? Mm -hmm. It's because they tend to come from well, African homes mm -hmm. that are tend to overwhelmingly be Christian and mm -hmm. regularly attend church. Mm -hmm. They have attentive parents and mm -hmm. they, they have certain values imbued in them. Mm -hmm. And that makes a much bigger difference than sitting there and talking about how the white man is trying to keep you down. The white man is happily to watch his, you know, white working class boys also be at the bottom of, mm -hmm. of, of the education system. <laughs> yeah. So I don't think I don't think it's that simple. Mm -hmm. um, and you know the saying I you know I may hate you but I love myself more comes mm -hmm. into play. Mm -hmm. Because if you can show yourself to be of value to someone or to a community, mm -hmm. that means a lot more than any other prejudice that person might have about you. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think the Jewish community ex exemplifies that perfectly. Cool. So to wrap up, what advice can you give to young people coming up from a black Asian or minority minority ethnic court about how they can progress you know and rise up against the odds um the extra lane is never crowded um mm -hmm. even if you feel like the odds are stacked against you always mm -hmm. do the most mm -hmm. dress well how mm -hmm. you present yourself is going to take you it's, it's going to be about 60 percent of what takes you where you're going mm -hmm. speak well be reliable be professional be kind be genuine mm -hmm. um and have a goal and just think be very laser focused on what you want to achieve mm -hmm. um at the end of the day, I think most people don't realize how insular everyone is. I think if you think that someone is going to deny you opportunities because of the color of your skin, if you really think objectively, that person has their own issues. That person's mm -hmm. probably not thinking about you. That person mm -hmm. doesn't go home and think, how can I hold this person down? And I think it's very easy to get kind of caught in this myopic, very negative, pessimistic view of things. Um, but if you really just give yourself the best chance mm -hmm. and always put your best foot forward, no matter what, no matter how you're feeling, and sometimes that might be cutting negative people out of your, your life mm -hmm. so you can be more focused and be more well-rounded and positive. Mm -hmm. You must do it. Fantastic. Esther, thank you very much thank you, for Uncle. your time. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, this is the end of this week's edition of the Against All Odds podcast. I hope you've learned something and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Have a great week. If you like this video, remember to like, share and subscribe so you never miss another one of these inspirational videos.